Um, so thank you for being here. I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news are that the topic of this presentation is a little bit misleading. Uh, I use the words product development and millennials because uh, they are sexy baits and I wanted a full room. Um, the good news is that the topic will be much deeper. Um, it's about how cognitive science can shed some light on what the generation gap really is. And it's um, useful uh, for all kinds of intellectual, intellectual business where you have to work with other people, uh, where, when you have to collaborate and uh, have a diverse team. So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about myself first because it always relaxes me. Uh, <laughs> my name is Pedro Prats. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a violinist. It turns out that uh, you need talent for that. Uh, so then I wanted to be a medic. It turns out that you need high grades for that. So I did get into medic school. I, I got into dentistry and I hated it. So uh, I went to software engineering as one does and I kind of learned how to like it. Um, <clears throat> I would tell everybody that I would never wear a suit and tie. So first job I landed was as a consultant for a big corporate company and I wore a suit and tie for almost 10 years. Um, and then I became a product manager and I think I really found what I like to do. Um, but I'm here mostly as a dude who studies some stuff. I have some strong opinions on the future of work and that's why I joined landing jobs. And um, I really like the mysteries of the mind and that's why I'm a PhD student in cognitive science right now. So, before I begin, I have to ask you a question. Hands up in the air, who thinks can read a analog clock? Can you tell me time on an analog clock? So, wow, that's lots of smart people in here. I'm not as relaxed now. Um, so, you can tell me what time it is here. Nine o'clock, great. So, really smart people here. Um, and what's the angle between the hands? It's 90 degrees, right? So, um, you have all it takes for a challenge. I did for several years when I was interviewing uh, candidates that were fresh out of college. And you know, for those candidates, they have no experience whatsoever. So conversation quickly runs out. So I did a challenge with them. Um, this challenge was really to uh, understand, I didn't want to select the best ones. I, I just wanted to uh, see if there were some red flags. So the challenge was this one. What's the angle between hands at a quarter past three? Well, <clears throat> and almost all candidates would answer very quickly and say, zero degrees, and I would say, oh, that's wrong. They would get, like, confused, and they would look at me like, well, are you kidding with me? Are you being a smart ass? Oh, perhaps it's 360, there's something there. No, no, that's wrong, too. And then uh, I would tell them, please guide me through your thoughts. I want to know how you are reaching these numbers and they would start saying lots of stuff. Some told me things that don't really make sense, but they would somehow explain it. And I even had a, wait, what happened there? There's something, um, I'm not seeing the whole slide here.
Et je suis à genoux sur mon dos. Non, non, ça va. Ça va. Comme je suis ici. Mais j'ai envie de me faire. Não, não, é muito suave, é verdade. Aquilo é o meu... o meu... o meu... o meu pé. Está aqui. Devia estar ali. Vê, há aqui a área que não está aqui. Não, 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 não. So, I think we fixed the issue. I was here, let me put this in. I want you to have the whole experience. There, much better. So, I was telling you that uh, some candidates would give me strange answers, and I even got one that told me uh, 72 degrees with absolutely no reasoning whatsoever. Well, needless to say, uh, she didn't get the job. But I would make them walk me through their thoughts, and by themselves, they would reach a moment I would call the Eureka moment, uh, where by themselves, they would understand that there was a detail they weren't thinking about. It has to do with analog clocks, and that's the thing that, yes, when it's three o'clock, the hour's hand is exactly pointing at three, but as 15 minutes pass by, that hand moves a little bit. So the angle isn't uh, zero or uh, 360, it's uh, something else. And from now on, it was just problem solving, you know. I really didn't care about the second part. So this challenge was a two-act exercise. I was, uh, in the first part, until the candidate reached T1, the Eureka moment. Uh, I was mostly uh, gathering information about the candidate's soft skills. I was uh, paying attention on how they uh, talked with me, how they would uh, communicate their line of thought, how they would deal with the frustration of giving the, the wrong answer. Uh, the second part was much more straightforward, just problem solving, it's nothing special, and uh, Almost everyone could do it. If they couldn't, that would be a red flag. However, the strange thing is that as years passed by, T1 would get uh, much longer. They would take much more time to reach the Eureka moment. And I'm, I'm uh, talking about a four-year span or something like that. And this was really strange for me because they, they would get to the Eureka moment by themselves like before but they would just take longer. How come? So I decided to look at this as a scientist, and I gathered my variables, my independent, dependent, control variables, and I understood that most of the things were constant. The age of the candidates was always the same. They were all out of college. Um, it was the same context. They were all a little bit stressed, and. So it's the same candidates. The only thing that changed was the year of birth. They were getting to be born in later years as years passed by. So I Googled it, as all academics do. And here's what I found. Of course, the internet had a lot of juicy stuff about how young people are unable to read clocks. However, that was not the case. They could read analog clocks. 
They could reach the Eureka moment by themselves. I wouldn't teach them how the, the hands work. They, they knew how it wor they worked, and they would reach the right answer. It was just that it took harder for them. And that made me think that uh, perhaps it has to do with the way they were thinking. Their mechanisms of thinking were so different, or getting different, in a way that it was harder for them um, to process the information. So, does this mean that millennials uh, think digitally? Uh, no, it's, it's not that. It's really that they just took longer. So, they, they, there has to be something in their cognition that explains it. And I think cognitive science can help us understand what is that, what mechanism is making them think differently, and Understanding that, that mechanism uh, may help us out uh, in product development because we are building products for and now with uh, more than half of the workforce is millennials. Uh, so we are uh, getting more diverse. So these mechanisms of thinking may be very useful if you are managing teams or if you're building products or if you're doing any kind of intellectual work. So, the agenda for this presentation is, well, mainly I'm going to try and break the Guinness record for the quickest 101 cognitive science class. So I'm going to run blazingly flat, fast uh, with some experiments that are very important, like the split brain, uh, Libet and Kahneman for decision making and neuroplasticity. And then hopefully in the end, I'm um, trying to make some sense of it all. So the split brain, I really love this one. Um, you must have all heard about the left and the right side of the brain, the left being much more analytical, the right being much more uh, emotional. Well, I think most of those articles are a little bit pseudoscientific, but there's, there's uh, some grounding to that. Um, the left brain, the left hemisphere, is where some control centers are, for example, for the language processing, and the right side of the brain uh, is where some creative um, circuits are, uh, for example, for drawing. And Language and drawing will be important for the split brain experiment. So, uh, disclaimer, the, the next slide will be ugly. Um, in the 60s, I think, they were trying to uh, find a cure for epilepsy. And the cure was bisection. Hemispheres, Hemispheres are mostly disconnected. There's, um, for the most part, they are completely disconnected from each other. There's only this little part here, which is called the corpus callosum, which is a beam of neurons that go uh, from one hemisphere to the other. And that's the only thing that connects the two hemispheres. And at the time they did the bisection, they cut that part the patients would survive, and epilepsy would be, for the most part, uh, controlled. And uh, the patients would behave uh, seemingly normal. However, uh, they did this experiment, and we found that it's not true. They, they, there was something different with them. Well, uh, they would ask the, the patient to look at this point here. So uh, everything that is on the right side of this point will be on the right side, on the right uh, view um, of the, the, the patient. Um, everything that is on the left will be on the left side of uh, the patient's view. And it's not the right eye or the left eye, you know? It's both eyes have a right side and a left side. And the right side of what you're seeing goes directly. There's a circuit, a physical circuit, that goes directly to the left hemisphere. So it's the, the opposing hemisphere. And everything on the left goes to the right hemisphere. 
So if the word face was on the right side, that information would go directly to the left hemisphere, and they would ask the patient, what are you seeing? Remember, the language control centers are on the left. The patient would be able to say, I'm seeing the word face. So all normal here. However, when they got to this part, they would present the word face on the left side. The left side goes to the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere has no control center for language. So uh, the patient would say, well, nothing. I'm, I, I can't see anything. That was really strange. But stranger would be when they would ask for the patient to draw with the left hand, which is controlled with the right hemisphere, to draw what they were seeing. And the patient would be able to draw a face. So the same patient that would say, I'm seeing nothing, would be able to draw what he was actually seeing with the left hand. So the information about the word face was on the right hemisphere. But the right hemisphere had no connection with the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is the only who can produce language. So, and the patient would say nothing. The patient wouldn't say, I can't tell you. No, they would say nothing. I'm seeing nothing. Wow, th this was really groundbreaking. Philosophers went nuts with this. They took all kinds of conclusions. Uh, but it really seems that if you split the brain, you get to consciousness. So it's almost as there are two different people in, inside the brain. OK, so I had so much to talk about this. But the thing I wanted to, to, for you to remember about this, the split brain experiment is that, well, now we are completely sure that there's a lot going on that we are not conscious of, uh, some, uh, lots of stuff that is being processed before we even are able to address those thoughts. So I'm going to speed up like crazy. And I'm going to talk firstly about Libet. Libet had this thing he called the readiness potential. He would use uh, electroencephalograms, so uh, read uh, electrical potentials in the brain. And um, he would. Uh, tell uh, the, the patient to uh, make a movement with the wrist. Um, and he could uh, identify uh, some spikes in electricity. So there was one here, one here, and one here. So 20, uh, 200 milliseconds before the, there was a movement, the, the patient was conscious that he had just made the decision to move a wrist. For us, it seems like it's spontaneous, but it's a trick that your brain does to you. So when you think about moving a wrist, you made that decision 200 milliseconds before uh, the wrist moves. However, there was always a spike 350 milliseconds before the conscious decision. And this was groundbreaking again. Wow. It seems like the brain takes a decision before you know you took it. Well, uh, Libet and others took very jumpy conclusions about free will and whatnot. Um, that's not what's important here. The important part here is that we take decisions before we know we take them. And that it has m very much to do with Kahneman. Kahneman talks about different systems of thinking. And there's system one, where you make most of, of your decisions. It's very intuitive, very fast. It's uh, associative. It's automatic. It's emotional. And then you have system two, which is very slow, very lazy, logical, analytical. and. The important thing here for this presentation is to think of what is system two working on. As system one is so quick and fast, when you try to make a decision, you are already working on the decision you made previously with system one. So, and well, system two is really good at explaining stuff. So system two is mostly used to explain what we had already decided on system one. 
So, and we are really good at this. I think you can extrapolate carefully uh, that this is why it's so hard to make people change their minds. Because once they make up their minds with not so much of logical and analytical thought, they stick to it and they use all their analytic uh, uh, skills to, to explain why they made that decision. So, and now, neuroplasticity, really, really fast about this. Uh, critical periods is a period in your life where when your brain is, or parts of your brain are particularly susceptible to being changed, being changed physically. Uh, and that's why, for example, with language, it's, a, it's something we know uh, really well. Uh, language, um, if you don't learn a language in early years, you will never be able to be a native. And that's because we know that there's a period in the first two years of your life where uh, those parts of the brain that are meant to process language are uh, uh, able to be changed. Afterwards, it's really difficult to change the, the brain physically. So it's like, well, for you guys that understand computers, it's like a GPU. Uh, a GPU is really good at processing graphics. It's really fast, really performant. Um, but the CPU can also process graphics. It's just slower. And the language center is really, really fast at processing language. But you can also learn a language afterwards, and then you are going to use other parts of your brain to process that language. So, but you'll be, always be less efficient, slower. Like I'm, I'm being right now. English is not my native language. So, take home messages from, from these three uh, experiments, or four. Um, there's a lot of stuff, let's call it stuff, that happens at the subconscious level. So what you are aware of is just a very, very, very small part of all the information that is being processed on your brain. That stuff is what shapes the way you think. So if it shapes the way you think, it shapes your decisions, it shapes the way you behave. And that stuff is hardwired. And I have to do this, I hate this, but perhaps there's a teacher of mine here and I don't want him to. Um, but it's hardwired, so it's physically, it, it has physically changed in the brain. And it's set mainly at the critical periods at young age. Well, uh, a conclusion for, uh, first conclusion for this, is that the computational theories of the mind uh, cannot explain this very well. These this theories make a metaphor between computers and the brain, so you have hardware, software, data, but you can give all the data you want about the language to somebody, and they will never be able to speak that language natively if they don't receive that information at young age. So it's not like computers. Uh, and it's much more complex than that. And let's leave it at that. And the, the point I really wanted to make with this presentation is that when we are talking about generation gaps, we are mostly talking about cognitive gaps. Um, Yes, there are some contextual things like uh, the salary you earn, how easy it is to, to get an apartment, how you saw your parents grow up, yeah. But all of that has shaped you uh, in the way you think. Uh, so y your computer, your brain is different from your parents. Uh, and that's why you think differently. So, how could we change a generation? Well, I, um, I remember my, my father was one of the smartest people I have ever known. And um, 
he could never use an ATM machine. He would go to the ATM machine twice a day. Uh, so he would had lots of experience with ATM machines, but he was really slow at it, and it made me crazy. <sighs> you, you, to change the way we think, we have to. It's really hard, and I think it, that, that's why. It's the way you think is shaped internally. And why should you try to change a generation? Well, isn't there an opportunity here? I think, I think there's, there's an opportunity. Um, millennials, uh, well, I don't want, really want to talk about millennials. There's lots of articles about millennials. You all have your own ideas. But they are half of the workforce right now, so don't fight millennials. They will win. Uh, and they are really good at reading digital books. So use it in your advantage. And um, there's an opportunity here for embracing cognitive diversity. People have been talking more and more about cognitive diversity. I think that's the way to go. Uh, also because we are living in a very fast times where generations come and go really fast. They are really diverse from each other. And we have an opportunity here to make teams that are working with diversity to become better. So ways to embrace cognitive diversity will be my next presentation, if you like this one. And I thank you all for, for coming here. Uh, hope this was useful, and I'm open to questions if you have some. I said, um, you, you told us you, you have very strong thoughts on, very strong opinions on the, uh, the future of work. So I was asking you for, uh, for a teaser as well. Especially in the tech world. Well, I think tech will be work in the future. So most of us in the future and our children will be always tech related people. And I think that is changing right now. The future is now. And you can see that uh, people are wanting to take ownership of their own careers. Um, they don't want to rely anymore on pre-made paths for them. Um, and they want to work on things that make them happy and has meaning to them. Uh, so I really think millennials and future generations are going to be guardians of the products of the future because they won't work in stuff that doesn't make sense to them. Making money for them is not that important. It's important to change the world. If you need money for that, they will do it. But um, I really think that there's a bright future ahead and I'm really hopeful the future comes fast. So, uh, I want to tease you, <laughs> because oh. I'm working with what you're talking. And uh, the thing is, the generation gap uh, is the thing that have been for thousands of years, of course. And uh, you can uh, even read Plato, who wrote that the children now are spoiled and love luxury and so on. So, that's what people of our age could say about the younger people now. And the thing is, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, have you dug into semiotics, into anthropology, let's say, and so on? Uh, and if you have applied to your thoughts about that? Well, uh, I have not. Uh, anthropology is, for sure, um, a discipline that uh, works um, in tandem with Cognitive science, uh, just like neuroscience, or AI, or psychology, linguistics. Um, so, 
for ancient history I'm not really good at. What I'm pretty sure is that never before in the history of mankind, we have been evolving so quickly. So, as I told you, generations are coming and going at such a fast pace. Uh, I don't think Plato would have so much of a cognitive gap with his direct predecessors or with uh, future generations of the time. Um, so I, I hope I, I give, gave you an answer. Hello, my name is Constantine. Um, you talked about cognitive diversity, and uh, I would like to know what kind of tasks uh, fit best for millennials, what they are good for, what they are best for, why, why they are better than previous generation in what kind of tasks? Uh, I think previous generations, before millennials, um, were taught or had the experience of things being very difficult to do. Um, when I started working, I'm a millennial, by, by the way, so just to put me in perspective. But um, when I started working, I was uh, dealing with a technology that had absolutely no documentation, and Google was not a thing. So you had to to solve simple problems, you had to make a really big effort. Nowadays, people who take uh, uh, graduate in economics or psychology or whatever, they go for a boot camp in Le Wagon or uh, Iron Hack or whatever, and in six months they are really good coders. They are really good at what they're doing, and they can do anything. So I think millennials are really good at adapting, at uh, learning really fast, and learning the right way, learning in a pragmatic mode. Uh, and they are not good at uh, having to go through pain to do stuff because they know that's not needed anymore. If you are hurting uh, in your job, then you're doing something wrong. It shouldn't be that like that. 